Interesting. A question says, um, okay, I'm not agree. Yes. <clears throat> I don't agree that everyone put hands on others. That, yeah, because they can transmit demonic power. Okay. It's a good point. What, what they're saying is they don't agree with everybody laying hands on everybody. I, and I understand that and I agree too. The, I am very picky about who lays hands on me. Uh, I could give you <laughs> laying hands on me or prophesying to me. I'm extremely picky about it. And if, if I've had people ask me, you know, can I speak into your life? And I tell them, well, you speak and I'll decide if it goes into my life. I'm not going to just give them an open door to say whatever you say is, you know, I agree with. So, and I have, I've had a lot of people that would try to lay hands on me. Uh, usually it has to do with they want to do that so that later when you go do something, they can say that they gave you what you went and did it with. <clears throat> so, uh, so, yeah, I agree. I don't uh, just get in every line and let people lay hands on me. And which is funny because we're telling people here, go out and lay hands on people. But the difference is, and this is one of the things, because it said the point also was that because you can transmit demonic stuff that way, which is true. But Dr. Summerall used to say, flies don't land on a hot stove. <clears throat> so if you're, as long as you're hot and on fire for God, you don't have to worry about it, which is true. Now, however... If you submit to someone laying hands on you, then you are submitting under that, so that's why you should know who lays hands on you. And you shouldn't let just anybody lay hands on you in the sense that, you know, somebody comes up to you and wants to do it, and you say, but you're telling us to do it, lay hands on everybody. Yeah, I'm telling you to do it. I'm not telling you to have everybody lay hands on you. You should be the hand layer honor, okay? You shouldn't have to have hands laid on you. Matter of fact, even <clears throat> now... I will pray for anybody. And if you ask me to pray, I will pray. That's, I, I told, made a vow to God early on that I would never turn down a place to preach or the opportunity to pray for somebody. And we've never done that. So at the same time, one of the things that I'm, there's a couple of aspects to what we're doing that one thing is we're seeing more and more people healed while listening to what we're teaching. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them. And so if you're going to be a person that's going to have what you need to lay hands on the sick and heal them, then if you're sick, it would be good if you get it directly from God yourself so then you know what you've got that you can give away. Now, I'm not saying I won't lay hands on you, I'm not, and I'm not saying I'll turn you down because I won't. But at least try first. Okay, and one thing that I'll bring out <clears throat> everything if you go through the Bible, you start in Mark 16, that is healing for the unbeliever. A believer lays hands on the sick for the unbeliever. Okay, you really don't find any place where believers are laying hands on other believers for healing. Okay. So you've got four characteristics or four uh, categories of people. Matter of fact, I just did a teaching on this recently that it'll be on CD or it'll be on MP3s on our website. But I'm trying to remember what they call it. <coughs> Qualified for healing or healing for all, something like that anyway. But basically there are four categories. You've got the unsaved, you've got the newly saved, you've got the carnal Christian, and you've got spiritually mature Christian. Right, So those are your basic four categories of people. Now, God has made provision for every person, regardless of what category they are in, to get healed. Mark 16 is healing for the unbeliever. Real simple, right? The believer lays hands on the unbeliever. That gets them well. It doesn't say what qualifications you have to have other than being sick. Right? Nothing else. So don't you put qualifications where God has not. Okay? Number two, <clears throat> healing for the brand new believer. Okay? That would be in the book of James. James chapter 5, it says, If there be any among you that's sick, any sick among you, 
Let them call for the elders, and they will come and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord and pray the prayer of faith. Now, <clears throat> in that case, they are anointing with oil, but that's not laying hands on the sick. There's a difference. And they are anointing with oil. Now, this is a brand new believer. It does not say, if there be any sick among you, shame on you. You know, you dirty dog, you shouldn't get sick. Well, no, you shouldn't get sick. But he doesn't scold you for it. He gives you the remedy. And the remedy is, call for the elders. The elders should be able to come to you and get you healed by anointing with oil, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And you get healed. As a matter of fact, we'll look at that verse a little bit later on, specifically because there's a lot of details in there, and it kills a lot of sacred cows. That's in James chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 15. You read through those. Now, <clears throat> so that's healing for the unbeliever and healing for the brand new believer. Now, healing for the carnal believer, which a carnal believer is a person who is sense or flesh ruled. Okay? To be carnally minded means to be ruled by the flesh, you know, ruled by your senses. And so, <clears throat> the only place we have that talks about how a carnally minded believer can get healed is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where it talks about communion. You have to remember, if you will, again, we'll look at this a little bit later on also, but you have to remember that in 1 Corinthians, uh, starting in chapter 2, it goes on and he calls them carnal and said they're not spiritual but carnal. And then you read on through and you get to chapter 11 and he's talking about the Lord's Supper and communion. And he said, for this reason, many of you are sick, weak, and die prematurely. And it's because you don't discern the body of Christ that was broken for your healing. And you don't recognize that by his stripes you're healed. So he has made provision through communion for you to be healed, even if you're a carnal-minded Christian. So you don't have to be spiritual, you don't have to be perfect. Then, of course, <clears throat> the last one is in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, what is it, verse uh, 16, I think it is, 14, 15, 16, right through there, yeah. He says that if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken, make alive, heal your mortal body by that same spirit. Now, that means that the way he, if you're a spiritual Christian, the way he wants to heal you is by the spirit that indwells you, not by the laying on of hands of someone else. So the reason he wants that is because that way, if you can get it for yourself that way, then you can turn around and give it to other people. All right? Now, <clears throat> a lot of people say, well, I'm sick and I can't pray for the sick until I get well. That's not true. The fastest way to get well is go when you're sick is to go pray for the sick. Sowing and reaping. It works. Okay? Now, if you have something contagious, you might not want to be laying hands on people. Okay? Well, you might want to be, they might not want you to lay hands on them. Okay? So, you just have to be kind of specific. Now, <clears throat> another question was, says, Brother Curry, from your martial arts background, do you have a problem with Tai Chi? No, I don't have a problem with it. I don't do it. <clears throat> Apparently, you do. No, no, see. <laughs> no, I, um, <clears throat> the martial arts that look the least violent are usually the most dangerous. Okay? The, the, the words Tai Chi are, depending on how you pronounce it, there's different pronunciations, but uh, for instance, the actual term is Tai Chi Chun, and it literally means grand ultimate fist. And it is the slow motion exercise, the breathing, the chi exercise. I say, I start talking about I start, I start thinking. <laughs> I have to be careful because I start moving into these things. But, it is to develop internal strength, chi. And if you get the chi flowing correctly, and then you have health and you have centeredness and all the stuff. Now, uh, <clears throat> another martial art that looks extremely Christ-like is Aikido. Because there's really no strikes and everything. So the original art was called Aiki Jiu-Jitsu and there were strikes, but then uh, Morihau Ishiba transformed it into a spiritual exercise and the idea was Aikido it means the way of harmonizing the spirit or spirit harmony and so 
That's what makes it so dangerous is because it is spiritual. So the more spiritual you get with it, the more dangerous it is in that sense. Now, again, the, the biggest problem I have with that, I mean, you know, I can't tell you what to do because you're going to do what you want to do anyway. So it really doesn't matter what I tell you to do. So, but the biggest problem is that you can't find, if you're doing those things, you are not looking like Christ. Simple as that. So people say, well, yeah, but I want my child in martial arts so they will develop discipline. You don't have to go to the world to get discipline, right? You can develop discipline in anything, and it's just a matter of how you do it. You can develop discipline through prayer, through fasting, through, di- through disciplines that you do. And so <clears throat> you can develop these things in you. Now, what you have to be careful about is when you try to develop discipline, making sure that it doesn't become legalism, because then you got people that are doing what you tell them to do, not because their heart has changed, but because they're trying to fit into your group. And when, the bad part about that is, once they do fit in, you don't know if their heart's really changed or if they're just fitting in. Now, the fastest way to find out what is in a person's heart is to remove all restrictions. As soon as you remove all restrictions, you'll find out what people really what they really want to do. And so, it, uh, you know, you just have to learn. You preach the truth and then let God take people into that truth. Right? It's one thing to preach truth. It's another thing to, to get over into legalism where you have to do something to fit into a group. Now, if someone comes into a meeting uh, dressed so immodestly that it's distracting the people or not right, then yeah, you, you take a drop cloth or whatever it is you want to call it and put it over them, you know? Um, you know, but the women should do that. Men shouldn't have to, right? And so they ought to be able to go to them and say, you know, you look cold here. Put this around you, <laughs> okay? And just, you know, at some point, the Bible says that the older women are supposed to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and how to, do, how to be women, and by the same token, the men are supposed to teach the young men the same thing, you know, how to be men and how to live right. Our problem is we do not have discipleship in the church. And so we end up, anything goes. And there's, you know, we don't have <clears throat> impact in other people's lives because we're so disconnected. That's why God made a discipleship system. So, now, um, but as far as martial arts and stuff, there's, just nothing in it that looks Christ-like, okay? So, not to mention the fact that you, if you do it, you will get devils, okay? Bottom line, um, spirit, all kinds of different spirits and things get involved, and <clears throat> there is no such thing as a Christian martial art instructor, okay? Real simple. So, um, I know there are various things that go on in that, but I'm just telling you, uh, I've been involved in martial arts I got out of it 20 years ago now, and I've had people, both when I was in martial arts and after that, I've had people pull guns on me, knives on me, and everything else. And in times past, I had to be able to deal with the situation myself. Since I got out of it and actually studied the Word of God and what the Bible says about the name of Jesus, I've had guns pulled on me and knives pulled on me. And I have dealt with them through the name of Jesus, and it was a lot easier. Okay, so just a lot less uh, strenuous. Okay, now, okay, uh, da, 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 da. yeah. Do you see sickness, injury, and birth defects all the same? Yes and no. Now, here's the thing. I am. Hopefully, everybody's growing. And everybody's at different stages of growth. And when the DHT was really birthed as far as what we were teaching, I was at a particular stage of my spiritual development that I had to do things certain ways, just like anything else. There's there's stages of growth. And so when I started, I had to find out how to stir up the gift of the Holy Ghost in me to get the job done. And I had to find out how, what it meant to pray fervently, which for me, usually what that means, or for, let me, as a general thing, what that usually means is you have to get out of yourself and 
act like a person you're not. Because if you just acted like the person you were, then it would already be working for you. Right? Well, for me, I'm a fairly quiet person. You know, I'd just soon sit in a corner somewhere and read as opposed to, uh, you know, being boisterous and all that kind of thing. And so I'm not a loud person. I don't, I've raised my children so that I didn't have to raise my voice to them. Uh, they knew that the, the quieter I got, the madder I was. <laughs> and so that was good on my voice, okay? And it made things a lot easier. And so for me to stir up and to show that I cared enough about that person to do whatever I had to do to get them well, then I had to get out of myself, which meant I had to be willing to get loud, I had to be willing to yell, I had to be willing to look stupid, you know, whatever it is, whatever it took. So for me, it was yelling, it was stirring up, it was getting very boisterous, and I've got some of the early videotapes where we were ministering, and it's, you know, I, I watch them, and it's amazing because the results now are actually stronger and better and faster, and it's a lot easier. And I think the difference, too, has to do with how many people I was praying for. Because back then, I could put 50% of my energy into whoever I prayed for, because I was probably going to pray for two people. Right? So I could give a whole lot out. Now when I pray for people, usually I'll end up praying for 100, 200 people at a time. So it's almost like you're pacing yourself. The beauty of it is, you have to be able to find out how to release the Spirit of God in you, whatever it takes, and then you have to be able to learn how to release it without it being any effort on your part. Because if you go to a hospital, you can't scream and yell, right? Because they'll kick you out. You know, you only get to pray for one person in a hospital if you scream and yell. So, <clears throat> but you have to be able to, sometimes you have to start by getting loud and strong to blast this thing. And then once you see results, then you start kind of toning down the blasting part while making sure that the results are still there. So <clears throat> I had to learn how to do that. Well, it wasn't that real easy, but it was a matter of necessity that, you, that I had to learn how to kind of pace myself. And you, you'll, you'll, a lot of this stuff that, the real answers that you want, you learn by doing. I mean, I can give you nuggets. I can give you the things that we've learned. I'm going to give you some tonight, just some, some points that go in. If you have your, the, the manual there, you can go to chapter one. That's where we're going to start. <clears throat> and the reason we're looking at this is because then I'm going to give you some testimonies and then I'm going to show you what I mean by this because every one of these chapters are important in this manual. And I'll give you testimonies for each one, but you've got to get the principle behind it. It's not a formula. You know, we've all tried the formulas and they don't work. So the difference is, is that you have to become whatever it is you're trying to get. You, you understand? Dr. Lake used to say that the secret of Christianity is not in the becoming. It's in the being. Well, when I say you've got to become it, I don't mean in the process of becoming. Christians are always trying to become it. Let, let me ask you this. Okay. How many of you believe in evolution, meaning... You know, we came from the primordial muck and one cell amoeba and it, you know, we became monkeys and then it, you know, the whole bit. All right, anybody believe that? Okay, nobody believes that. So what do you believe? You believe creation? So you don't believe evolution, you believe creation. Right, are you sure? Okay, the reason I'm asking is because, like you've heard probably before, we say we believe in creation, but we prove we believe in evolution because you keep thinking that if you keep coming to church every Sunday, eventually you will evolve into the Christian God wants you to be. <laughs> Whenever he never said you'll evolve, he said, if you're in Christ, you are a new, not a new evolution, a new creation. Amen? You have to realize this is a, the thing you're looking for has already happened. See, that's the key. The thing, and you say, well, if it did, how come I don't feel like it? Because it happened so long ago, you're used to feeling like you feel now. And you don't realize that the way you feel now is what anointed feels like. See, well, I don't feel anointed. Well, how do you know what feel anointed is? Well, you know, it's when you get goosebumps. Really? Well, you can go stand in a cooler <laughs> and become anointed. So if we, turn, if we turn the air conditioning way down, 
Everybody in here get anointed. Is that what you're telling me? No, see, it's not goosebumps. You're looking at the, I don't want to say symptoms, but you're looking at, the, at, at various manifestations as the cause, and they're not. See, I can take you, if I wanted to, I could stand up here and I could tell you stories that would have you crying. And you'd be crying, and you'd be feeling bad, and then I could turn right around and tell you some funny stories and funny testimonies and have you laughing, and I could do it all in five minutes. So I could take you from crying to laughing in five minutes. So what does that tell you? Your emotions are totally fickle, and you cannot rely on them. And yet when it comes to everything about Christianity, we go right to emotions. We want to feel something. We want to sense something. You know, we're looking for signs. Instead of signs following us, we're following them. Now, and the, the stuff that I'm saying for most of you is not new, but there has to come a point where you quit trying to become something and you just be. I mean, you're going to have to step over to that point to say, you know, I've got this. And you got to start acting like, let me, let me kind of say it this way. If you went to the police academy, well, you're a civilian, you're a person, you're like everybody else. And you're going to go to the police academy, and when you finish, you graduate, and they're going to pin a badge on you. And they're going to give you a gun or whatever it is, however it works here. Well, are you any different than you were before you got the badge and the gun? No, not really. You, know, you may have some new knowledge, but as far as a different person, do you think that policemen don't have emotions? Do you know when policemen have emotional uh, family situations going on, their ticket quota goes up? That's a fact. Why? They write more tickets when they're mad. See, I'm telling you, and see, it wasn't just, you know, well, it might have been your bad luck that you were there, okay? But you have to realize policemen are no different than anybody else. The difference is, is that they've been given authority to do something, right? But they're no different. And the authority they have is not theirs. They don't stand up there and say, stop in the name of Joe whatever, right? They say, stop in the name of the law. They say, stop in the name of, you know, the city, whatever city... Who, Whoever gave them the badge, they have the authority of that city or that government to do whatever that government has the authority to do. That's why, if I can get this across to you, your authority, technically, you don't have authority. Right? In Matthew 28, we talked about this just before we started to break a while ago. In Matthew 28, it says, all authority... In heaven and earth has been given unto me. Isn't that what Jesus said? Is that true or false? So Jesus has all authority. Okay, so that tells us two things. Number one, the devil has none. Right? Now, the minute the devil has some authority, that scripture is no longer true. Do you understand? Well, yeah, but you know, I gave the devil authority whenever... Wait, 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 wait. How did, you gave the devil authority? Well, I did whenever, I gave him authority to make my body sick whenever I did this thing. No. Why do you think that a thief and a robber has to have authority to do something? See, if a thief or a robber has authority, they're not a thief or a robber. They have the authority to do the thing. Right? What makes them a thief and a robber is the fact that they don't have authority. Number two, what makes you think you can give them authority? Because the minute you give them authority, I mean, first off, where did you get it from? Well, Jesus gave me authority. No, no. Because the minute he gave it to you, you, he doesn't have it all. I'm telling you, if you get a hold of this, this changes everything. You have to realize, whenever you speak in the name of Jesus, it's not because you have authority. It's because he has authority. The authority you're using is not yours. See, if you think it's yours, then you think you've got to live good enough, pray enough, fast enough, whatever it is, you've got to do something good enough so that God or Jesus will give you that little bit of authority he gives you. You don't see anywhere in there where he gives you that authority. What you see is that he has all authority. And if he has all, then the devil has none, and technically, you have none. 
Now, that, what does that mean? That means that you can't rely on your good works or your authority. You have to rely on his good works and his authority. And when you say go in the name of Jesus, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with Jesus. Amen? It's his authority. It's not your authority. <clears throat> you get it? Then the beauty, now see the thing is, the beauty of that is, number one, you've been told that you have delegated authority. You don't. Delegated authority is simply authority that has been given and can be taken away. Matter of fact, if you look in the Gospels and you see what Jesus did with the, with the apostles, they had delegated authority. He told them, you go into these cities and you heal the sick and you do these things. That is delegated authority. In other words, it is specified really for a specific purpose for a specific time. He sent them out on missions and they came back. Technically, when they came back, the authority he let them use stopped because they completed the mission. Right? It wasn't ongoing until he sent them to do it all. Right? Now, once you realize that, you start to realize that it's not about your authority, it's his authority. You see, again, you've got to get your mind off you so that it's no longer you that speak, but he that speaks when you speak. You understand? Now, what I'm, what I'm talking about, this is what <clears throat> all the guys that walked in any power, this is what they understood. They may not have had everything just right, but they understood these bits and pieces. And that's why they were so bold in speaking these things out because they realized that it wasn't theirs, it was Jesus's, and they were just mouthing it for him. He said, now, now listen though, he said, if they receive you, they receive me. If they don't receive you, they don't receive me. Right? Now do you realize how, what kind of union that makes you have with him? That means that you have when, when you go, in other words, when you speak, it's not you speaking. Now, we could go into a lot more in this, but if you go over to Hebrews, it even talks about it. And he says that it's really amazing when you, when you if you study the epistles, it is amazing. Because there is stuff there that you won't believe. I mean, you, you have to choose purposely to believe it because it's too good. I mean, it's amazing. That, I don't know why people want to live in the Old Testament all the time because the good stuff's in the epistles. I mean, it's just amazing when you read that. He, he said that, if, that there yet remains a rest, but he says that for those who believe, it said that we enter into God's rest. Right? Just look over. We're going to have to look over there because you, you're looking at me like a calf at a new gate. Like you don't want to know if you want to go in there or not. <clears throat> all right, let's go over here. We'll go to Hebrews. Uh, let's see where I want to go. Where was that? I think it was Hebrews. Was it four? Yeah, four. Yeah. Hebrews four. I'll just read through this real quick here because I don't want to take a lot of time here because this isn't part of it, but it's important. Hebrews 4.1 <clears throat> says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. In other words, we want to be careful, make sure that there has been a, because there's been a promise left to us to enter into his rest, and we want to make sure that we don't fall short of entering into his rest. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Watch this. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, all, now watch this, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You hear that? The works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. How many of his works? So God, God has ceased from all his works. Now, I always tell people there's about five words that Christians don't believe. One of those words is all. For some reason we read all and we think it says some. 
It didn't say he ceased from some of his works. He ceased from all of his works, right? From the foundation of the world. Now, and in this place again, verse 5, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So now we know that it takes faith to enter into the rest, and unbelief won't get you in there, right? Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered, now listen, he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. You hear that? So God says, enter into my rest. And he says, why? Because when you enter into his rest, you have ceased from your own works. Watch this. As God did from his. So you hear that? So God is not working. Is that what it says? It says that God has ceased from his works. It says that he, as a matter of fact, it says that those works were finished from the foundation of the world. See, now you can see why everything is past tense in the Bible. See, that's why whenever you heal the sick, it's not your works. Why? You've ceased from your works. So whose works is it? Well, it's Jesus's. Right? But now notice, God ceased from his works. So the works are done. So even the works you do is not works. It's not yours, you understand? And God's work is already done. So if God's work is already done, then people can't be healed. They have been healed. You see? So what is the, the fight of faith? To rest. That it's done. You see? Once, once you, see, the whole trouble that the devil tries to keep you from... Uh, the way he works is to try to keep you from resting. He will, he'll try to keep you in turmoil and try to keep you. See, what happened? Let me, let me put it into what we're talking about. You go, you pray for somebody. You lay hands on them. You step back, you look, nothing's changed. Most Christians, the first thing they do is, okay, let's, uh, well, we're gonna have to start, let's do it again. We'll start again. And you think you're starting over again because you think it didn't work last time. Well, you're not starting over. You're adding to. So you can only give what you got. So you put in them. Now, when you put it into them, you put in so much. <clears throat> now, I'm going to use some numbers here, but don't try to, don't try to be so <laughs> pharisaical that, <laughs> that you would try to you know, just really be nitpick over these numbers. I'm just using them as examples. But for instance, I'm going to try to give you some heart of this, why this works. <clears throat> Let's say it's the first time you've ever prayed for anybody, okay? Maybe you won't see anything. Who knows? Maybe you do. Great. If you do, if you don't, okay. Let's say it is brain cancer, okay? person's going to die if you don't get results, Okay, so the pressure's on, right? Now, at that point, you lay hands, but you've never seen anybody healed of anything, right? So now, you are trying to stir up faith and to get yourself stirred up to blast this thing so that you can do some good. But now, let's say you do something, but you don't see any change. And you step back and go, hmm, okay, well, I guess that didn't work. Okay, well now when you put your faith out there, it was working. But the minute you step back and go by your senses and your sight and you go, well, I guess it didn't work. Now you pulled your faith back and that's when it stopped. It was working until you said that, right? Even though you didn't see anything. Why? Because you put so little in there that you couldn't see it. Now, I've been able to determine really by experiment more than anything else that you have to get a person about 70% healed on the inside before you ever see any change on the outside. Most people's problems are, is that they don't keep pushing to ever get that person to a point where it goes from the inside to the outside so they can see it. 
So once they don't see it, they quit. Now, but let's say, let's say you got no results, and then you find somebody that's getting results, and you say, hey, do you mind if I go with you while you go pray for people? No, come along, let's go. So then you go, and you, you say, I'm, I'm just going to watch you while you pray for them. That person says, okay, fine, that's, that's good. Now, that person, they've been doing it. They've got results. Let's say they got really good results. Then they go in, and they minister to this person, and the person gets healed. Well, now, because that person is with you that never saw anything, never got any results, but they were with you when you prayed and you got results, now the next time they go to pray for somebody, they're more likely to get results because now they've seen it. Right? Why do you think God instituted the discipleship program? That's why. So that you could go with somebody and watch. Right? And then if you keep going with them, eventually that person should tell you, well, you pray this time. Now, whenever you say that, maybe you go, well, I don't know, I, I don't want this person to die. No, just go ahead, you pray. Now, while you're praying, do you think this person has been getting results? You think they're going to stand back over there and just look around and, okay, we'll just wait. No, they're going to be believing too. And that person's going to get healed, and you're going to think it was your faith that time that did it, and you don't know it was the other person standing there didn't do nothing, said yeah, and agreed and got it. But because now the results are there, you'll go, we got it. <laughs> Amen? And your faith will shoot up. Now, if the person that you're with is godly, they're not going to have an ego. And they're not going to go, hey, you didn't think you did that, did you? Now, I was over there believing. I mean, come on, who's getting the results here? Obviously, it was me, so don't think that was you. No, you know what they're going to say? They're going to look at you and go, you see there? You can do this. Even if they know it was their faith. Maybe they know it, all right? But they're going to go, way to go. You got that one? Hey, that's good. And now, the next time that person goes pray for somebody, guess what? More likely to get results. Why? Because that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Discipleship. They do it. They watch. They go out next time, the other person does it, the other person watches. Then they critique and they say, well, maybe you ought to say it this way or maybe you ought to do this way or what were you thinking, what were you feeling, what, what was going on? See, that's the question so a lot of times that I look for is when people say, when you lay hands on a sick, what's going on? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you, what are you doing? You know, because I can tell you, what you're believing at the moment you pray is what's going to happen. Now, now, if you're standing there, and think about this. If you're standing there praying for somebody, and you're, because all you're doing is releasing life. And when you're, you're, you're praying for them, see, there's two parts. There's the legal and the vital. The legal is the, in the name of Jesus, be healed, devil go, sickness. See, that's legal. That's serving the eviction papers, right? You are doing the legal part. Then there has to be the vital part where life flows out of your belly, will flow rivers of living water. Who actually heals the sick? The Holy Spirit. Where is he coming from? He's not falling out of heaven. He's pouring out of you. You get it? If he's pouring out of you. Now, he can pour out of you in a, like, like a fire that gives heat in all directions. See, our problem is we want formulas. And in reality, it doesn't work that way. It's like, being, it's like having a person near you. You get near a person, and they can sense your presence. Why? Because your spirit emanates, their spirit emanates, and the two spirits touch, and you can sense each other. Now, when your spirit is filled with the Holy Spirit, and they become one, now what that person senses is the Spirit of God. Right? He that's drawn to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Not two spirits, one Okay, so whenever you, and the more you pray in tongues, the more you build yourself up, that kind of stuff, the further out your spirit, the spirit of God through you, emanates. That's why Peter could walk by and they tried to put people under his shadow. It wasn't his shadow that was healing. It was saying that his, the spirit of God emanated from him the distance of his shadow. Right, so when you get around that, you can get in somebody's presence and get healed. Now, usually what people call that is they call it the anointing. It's not the anointing, right? It is the Spirit who is the anointing. You understand? And that's not the same thing. The reason I said that is because you think the anointing is when God 
dab something on you. You know, here, boom, you're anointed. Now you have a gift. You have a power. Nope, that's not it. We have wrong terminology. Okay, we will cover that while we're here. But what we see here is that as you begin to minister, that life flows into them. And, it, and when I lay hands on somebody, hands on flesh doesn't heal flesh. It is the spirit in the hand going into that person's spirit and then coming out of their flesh. Right? So it's spirit to spirit, not flesh to flesh. Spirit to spirit goes in. It's like pouring water on a plant. You don't pour water on the leaves because it doesn't do any good. You pour it in the roots so that the water goes up through the roots out through the leaves. Right? That's what's going on. So that's why you don't have to put your hands on the afflicted part. You can put it anywhere. Now, remember this. Here's what, what counts. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Right? So whenever you speak the words of God or when you lay hands on someone, it is spirit that's going into them. <clears throat> that spirit is the spirit of life. That's what heals. You can speak it. You can lay hands on them. You can, you can look at a person and transmit the spirit of God. Right? Through a look. And so... You can, you can emanate it because the power of God follows your intention. But let's say I'm standing in line, I'm praying for somebody. And I'm, I've already done the legal part. I've commanded this thing to go and now I'm fixing to let life flow into them. And right then someone walks up and says, Brother Curry, can you, and you draw my attention away. <clears throat> now, life can go into them if I'm touching them especially. But the idea is that because they have drawn your attention, now you're not connected to this person anymore. And so they're not going to get anything, per se. So you have to be connected to this person to some degree to be able to get life into them. Now, one of the fastest ways to get connected is through compassion. One of the fastest, not sympathy, compassion. Okay? Sympathy feels sorry for. Compassion knows it isn't right. That's the difference. And see, sympathy says, oh, you poor thing, I wish I could help. Compassion says, oh, you poor thing, let me help. There, there's a whole difference there, all right? Now, as you start to minister to a person, let's say you minister to them, and then the more, the more results you see, the more faith you have, especially for that. Now, for instance, if you pray for a, for a person with a migraine headache and it goes, now the next time you pray for a migraine headache, guess what? Two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to act different because they're going to tell you what it is and you're going to go, oh yeah, yeah, watch this. You say, why? Because you've seen it before. Oh yeah, migraine, yeah, watch. Right? There's a difference. Whereas before it's kind of like, okay, let's get this thing. Let's go. We'll, all right, we're going to do it. But this time it's like, oh, we've already seen that beat. Here, watch. You see what I'm saying? There's a different one. Because your faith level for that is now higher. Why? Because you've seen it. Now, you don't want to be just affected with migraine headaches. You want to be just as affected with cancer, with HIV, with anything else, right? So the key to that is what I generally call just the David principle. You know King David? Remember when, before he was king? And they said, you're going to go face that giant? He said, yeah, I'm going to go take care of Goliath for you. And they said, you're crazy. And he said, no, no, look. He said, God was with me with the bear. He was with me with the lion. He will also be with me against this Philistine, right? Now, that David principle is this. The secret to faith in every area, basically, is to be able to <clears throat> relate past victories to current situations. When you can relate past victories to current situations, you will have victory in every situation. See, when you start looking and say, well, God was with me with the migraine. Now, do you realize that the bear and the lion was less than the giant? Because the bear and the lion will run from you if they get a chance. Right? Generally, I mean, unless you get between them and their cub. Right? But they will try to get away. They, are not, they won't generally naturally come after you. Now, there's exceptions, of course. But they won't generally come after you. But a giant soldier on the enemy's side 
has one purpose, and that's to kill you. Right? So he had to take... Now, now think, either the bear nor the lion was as much of a danger as this Philistine. And yet, he said, well, of course I can take the Philistine. Why? Because God was with me with the bear and he's with me with the lion. Right? So he took two lesser things and said, because God was with me with the lesser, he will obviously take care of me against this greater. So the key is you have to be able to relate past victories to current problems. Right? And once you start doing it, so when you start realizing, well, from God's viewpoint, come on, HIV isn't any harder than migraine. Right? But the problem is we don't always look at it from God's viewpoint. We look at it from man's viewpoint. And the more input you have from man about it, the less you will look at it from God's viewpoint. Right? There was a... <clears throat> I don't watch a lot of television, but there are some shows that I enjoyed at different times. You know, and I try to watch them, and invariably they go downhill, and you have to quit watching them. <clears throat> for, for a while there, one of my favorite shows was a, a series called The Unit, mainly because of the, the camaraderie and the, the cohesiveness of the unit, right? Now, then they started getting stupid and showing garbage, and I had to turn it off. But if they'd have kept it with the military stuff, it'd have been great. Well, <clears throat> then there was another show, uh, another one that I liked was uh, NCIS and I always liked Jethro Gibbs, I don't know if you know who I'm talking about or not but I liked his attitude All right, I just liked the idea of being able to slap people in the back of the head, but anyway so <laughs> then and then there was another show that came out called House All right? and, and now the thing with House is I could relate to him because he was, he was very unorthodox and yet had a bit of an attitude, okay? And we were talking one day, and I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind being kind of a mixture between House and Jethro Gibbs. You know, just kind of a mixture in there. But I was watching that, and, I, you know, I didn't watch it all the time, but if I could, I'd catch it, and I'd watch it. And I was sitting there one night watching it, because it it's pretty neat, you know, to watch how it would show how the things were working, what was going on, that kind of stuff. And... I mean, but, and I'm not saying this for you, and, you know, in case you liked it. I mean, I liked the show, but I had to quit watching it, okay? <clears throat> so if you like it, that's fine. If you don't have to get, quit watching it, that's fine for you. But I'm just telling you what happened with me was, as I was sitting there watching it one night, as, I mean, very clearly, the Spirit of God told me, if you keep watching this, it's going to hurt your faith. And I thought, but it's a good show, man. <laughs> it's good, you know? And, I, and, you know, I was trying to use everything. You know, I'm like, but God, they're, they're beating sickness and disease. It's good, you know. He said, yeah, but they're not doing it through me. You know, so you, you just don't win arguing with God, right? So I was watching this, and I realized, because then when I was praying for people, I literally could almost see sometimes the way it would show how things would happen you know, when something goes wrong with the heart, you can kind of picture, you know, and it shows the electrical neurons going off, and you can kind of picture that. And I was praying for people, but the bad part was, I, I, I noticed, when I started praying for people, or whenever I asked them, what can I do for you? And they'd say, this disease or that disease. My mind would automatically go to the cause. Right? And it would automatically go to, well, you know, you're probably eating this wrong food, you're probably doing this wrong, you're probably, it's, the cause is probably this thing, and I realized it was hurting my faith. Because, see, eating the wrong food is not the cause of the problem. You understand? Eating the wrong food may cause a chink in your armor, so to speak, but it is a devil that exploits the chink in your armor. And we don't just stop at the chink in the armor, we go back to the cause. We go to the root of the thing. See, people say, do you believe in, in you know, roots of spiritual, you know, spiritual roots of diseases? Yeah, I do. It's called the devil. Real simple, right? Well, don't you believe that, you know, bitterness causes arthritis? No. Devil causes arthritis. And when you quit acting like him, you probably won't have it. Just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, lighten up, all right? Don't get, don't get mad. See, that's the problem with Christians. We take ourselves too seriously. 
I say, I don't take myself seriously, but I take my job very seriously, right? And that, that's why I last. It's because if I took myself seriously, you don't last. So you've got to be able to relax, enjoy life. See, if you don't enjoy it, you won't keep doing it. That's why it can't, it can't be a work to you. It can't be a, a struggle. It can't be something you have to do. It has to be something you get to do. And it, see, it has to get to a point where you enjoy it. And when you enjoy it, you'll do it, right? Well, the best way to enjoy it is to win, right? When you win, it gets enjoyable, right? <laughs> Losing is not enjoyable, okay? And when you lose too often, you start backing off. So the idea is, see, the devil's job is to get you to back off, which means to get you to lose. That's why he fights. Have you ever noticed he fights so hard just to, to, to keep you from getting that first healing? Why? Because he knows once you get the first one, there ain't no stopping you. Amen? So he will fight, just as we say, tooth and toenail, you know, to keep you from getting that first victory. But the beauty of it is, the key is, and remember, this is a whole fight of faith, is to get you to back off this word. That's his whole job, is to get you to back off. And if he can get you to back off this word, he's got you. Because remember, his weapons, right, are carnal. Our weapons are not. See, he is relegated to this natural world. He can bring nothing against you except what is common to man. You understand? So that means he has to bring natural weapons. But our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are not sense or flesh oriented. But our, God, our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And those strongholds are not necessarily just demons over a city. They, it, if you read the whole passage there, it is wrong teaching. It's doctrines. It's traditions that we have adopted. The devil can do nothing except you believe he can. And so as soon as you stop believing that he can do those things, he can't get at you anymore. Because all he's got is deception. Right? Now understand, he has ability. That's where sickness and disease comes from. But he has no authority. So if he doesn't have authority, it doesn't, I don't care what, I don't care how good a lock, a, uh, a burglar, I don't care how good a burglar is at picking locks, right? If he doesn't have a gun and he picks a lock and gets in my house, okay, I'm not going to call the police. <laughs> I'm going to call the coroner, right? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, I don't care how good he is at getting in. Once he gets in, he's not going to want in. Okay? He's going to know he came to the wrong house. Well, the whole idea is that the devil has no authority. He, now, he has ability, but Jesus took his authority. Jesus has all authority. The devil has none. The devil has ability, but he has no authority. But yet, you think he has authority because you've been taught you give him authority by doing something. And because you believe that, he takes advantage of it, even though it's not true. So when you quit believing he has authority, guess what? See, until you believe he doesn't have authority, you won't fight. Because you'll think, well, I gave him authority. He's got a right to be here. And until I get rid of this thing, or until I quit doing that, then I, he's just got authority to come in here. No. God, through Jesus, took that authority. You get it? Well, and well, you know, I'm trying to go back in and find out, you know, where my granddaddy's sin was. Because that's what caused this thing to come on me. No, what caused that thing to come on you is you committing the same sin your granddaddy did. And when you quit sinning, then that thing can't even come after you. Do you understand? It's amazing to me how Christians are so afraid of the devil. And yet, the Bible says very clearly that blessings overtake us. It doesn't say you have to chase them. Right? It says that they overtake you. In other words, you can't outrun them. But yet we got Christians always trying to find out where everything, you know, everybody in their history, what they did wrong, and because they got to go in and stop this. That in itself is a lie of the devil. Number one, Jesus didn't do it. And if Jesus, if you're his representative, the representative can only say what the one he represents said. Jesus never dealt with generational curses. He never dealt with any of that stuff. And yet, it's funny because even, we'll see this a little bit later on, in Ezekiel 18, it tells you very clearly, 
He said, you will never have occasion to use this proverb again. And it's funny, because even in the Old Testament, they quit saying that. Now, first time it was brought up was in Exodus, then in Numbers, then in Deuteronomy. And th- now, those were all early. And then Ezekiel comes out and says, that's not true anymore. That stopped. Now, every soul that sins dies. And, every, and, and, and if you don't do those things, you'll live. And if you do them, you'll die. That's what he said. Right? And that was afterwards. So that negated whatever was said before. So you've got to realize, Revelation is progressive. There were things that were said. God said, you're going to do these sacrifices perpetually. You will do them from now on. Right? But how many of you do them? You don't. Why? Because they were all types and shadows of Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, for instance, we talk about having to sacrifice bulls and goats. And the blood of bulls and goats covered their sin. Right. Well, are we still sacrificing bulls and goats? No. Why? Because the type and the shadow that those bulls and goats were, the reality of it came. So we don't have to do that anymore because they were to point us to the reality. Right? What well, He said the same thing with some of those things in the Old Testament. And our problem is we think they're still in effect and they're not. You know, first off, the bad part is <clears throat> the law was given to the Jew. Not to you. But yet, you had to come to church to get back under the law. <laughs> Amen? So, I mean, you didn't even know about it. I mean, you were just being a good sinner. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Good at sinning. Not a good sinner, but good at sinning. You were, because you didn't care. You didn't care about what laws you broke. Right? You had to come to church to find out what laws you were breaking. Right? And yet that wasn't even written to you. And now we're trying to go back under it and start a whole new Judaism. And we're trying to fulfill these things. And well, if you don't get your offering in by the Day of Atonement, God's not going to bless you. Too late. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3. God has already, hath, past tense, blessed you. Right? <clears throat> you can't take away what he's already done. 